God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your way, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Thank you, Grant. And thank you, church. What beautiful voices each one of you have. Open your Bibles with me, if you will, this evening to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 22, and we're going to read down through verse 3 of chapter 2. So stay with me as we begin. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and the enduring word of God. For all flesh is as grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice, deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Adjusting to these little dinky glasses... I don't know what the end's going to be, but I am enjoying the ride. And thank you for being willing to ride with me. They say it could be uh, up to a month before my eyes actually complete making all the adjustments that, uh, uh, that they're going to make. And so far, I'm very pleased, not only with the distant vision, but also the up-close vision. So let's get right back into what God is saying. In, in verse 22, since, since... He's talking about something that you've done. It, it's almost like therefore. But here he says, since. Since you have completed this action. Since you have allowed God to work in you. We know that it's all God and not us. If it had not been for the blood of Jesus Christ, not a single one of us would, would be saved. It would be impossible for us to be saved. But we've got to yield to, to what God is saying. Allow yourself to be saved. And we do that by yielding to the truth of His Word. Very, very same thing. The Holy Spirit is involved very much. We saw that in the very first few verses of, of chapter 1. And, and if you'll go back up there and look at that, especially in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Really the same thing that he's saying in verse 22. The very same thing that he's saying in verse 22. Brings about the same result. So let's go back and look at verse 22 again. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. That's the sanctification. Purification, sanctification, often the very same word in, in, in the New Testament. But, but the, the context will, will tell us how that word needs to be used. But in this case, it means the very same thing that, that it did in, in verse uh, 2 when it talks about the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Sanctification simply means to be drawn closer to God, to be set apart for God's work. Now, you can be more sanctified today, hopefully, than you were yesterday as you draw closer and closer to God. But you could also at the same time be less sanctified as you move away from God. Now hopefully, prayerfully, God's desire for you is that you be drawn closer to Him and be set aside for His purpose. And that's exactly what is happening in chapter 1 and verse 22. That you 
have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. That's not actually what you have done. It's what you have allowed God to do in you. And it is your, your will and God's will. You have made a choice. God made a choice to save those who would be sanctified through the Holy Spirit. You made a choice to allow yourself to be sanctified through the Holy Spirit. And in verse 22, it is this way, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. That, that to me, that, that's an incredible verse. An incredible thought that we could, we could bring on the action of God whenever we obey Him. Now, obedience to the truth is not one of those standalone verses. Not, not a standalone phrase. It's very much like being born again. It is not a standalone phrase. In obedience to the truth, uh, and, and it's like our purification or our sanctification. Those are not standalone ideas or standalone verses. In, in, in the first part uh, of the book, in, in uh, chapter 1, there in verse 2 and 3, uh, our, our sanctification by the Holy Spirit. Is, connecting with, is connected with our hope, a living hope that we have. Here in verse 22, it's connected with our obedience to the truth and our salvation that is there. So listen to what God is saying. Since you have been, since have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, or fervently is used there first instead of at the end. In, in the Greek, it's at the end. And, and that's the way the Greeks would use it. They would modify what had been said by the word that they would use at the very end of a thought. And here, the translators have put it before the end of that thought. Fervently love one another with a pure heart. But God, in His, His actual saying this through Peter, said that we are, are to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And he tells us how that love is to work. Two different love words there. Two different love words in our action. And, and we're going to look at, at more of what God has to say about that. But two different love words. The first one is that phileo word. It's that brotherly love. And, and we should be able to identify, identify that whenever he is saying that we, are, uh, we have purified our souls in obedience to the truth, to the unfeigned or the sincere love of the brethren. So we, we see that when it was talking about love of the brethren, we, we should know that it's talking about phileo love, because that's brotherly love. But then he comes back and he tells us how important it is that we love one another, that we love one another from the heart fervently. Fervently. And, and this love is the agape love. I want you to turn just a few books, maybe just a few pages in your Bible, to 1 John in chapter 5, and listen to what God says here. And it sounds very similar to what He has just said through Peter. And here this time He's saying it through John in the first two verses. John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He said, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Very similar language to what we're finding over there in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. So he's not just saying that we have a responsibility to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Remember that from our, our lesson this morning in Deuteronomy when we're talking about all things that are connected to God in the Old Testament. And God tells His people in, in their responsibility to God uh, is that they are to love God with all of their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. As, as he is talking about this this agape kind of love. And, and then he goes on to tell the, the fathers, really even though it, it says that you are to do this, he's talking to the fathers, that you are to teach these things to your children. The Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. He is one God, even though He is made up of three, and that's beyond our ability to comprehend. I mean, we, we know it, we accept it, we believe it, but our efforts to explain it just, just aren't adequate. The Lord our God is one. He is one God. And we're to love Him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And these words are to be taught to our children. 
The father's responsibility. Teach it to your children when they're sitting in your house, when it's time to go to bed, when it's time to get up, when you're walking in the way, wherever you are, you make sure that you're teaching this concept to our children. Father's responsibility. And there it is connected to God. But listen to what he is saying again in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the children also. Our direct responsibility, if we're loving God, if we're loving God the way we should love God, and if we're born of God, this new birth, then we will love our brothers. We will love our brothers. And in chapter 2 in, in uh, uh, 1 Peter, he's going to come back and tell us things that we've got to get rid of if that love is going to be effective. That we will love our brother, brothers. We'll love those who also are born of God. In verse 2 of, of 1 John chapter 5, he says, by this, we know the love, uh, we, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. That's so powerful. He says, this is how we know that that kind of love is being effective whenever we keep His commandments. When we keep His commandments. We know that we're also loving our brothers. In fact, Jesus said uh, during His ministry that this is how the world will know that we are children of God. That we are believers of God. When we love one another. Just in the very same way that He has loved us. So now let's go back and we'll bring those very same thoughts back in as God is doing that through Peter in, in verse 22 of 1 Peter. Since you have in obedience, God was talking about obedience in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren fervently, or let's read it the way that God put it, love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervent love. It's going to be different. This agape love is different than just brotherly love. Agape love is a love that is the same regardless of when you look at it. Almost like God Himself. For God does not even cast a shadow. There is not even a shadow of difference in God is what James or what God says through James in chapter 1. And here He's telling us that we are to love one another from a pure heart fervently. The love of God is never any different. It's always consistently the same. You'll not even find a shadow of difference in the love of God. And that's powerful. And that's brought out by the word fervent. That word fervent means outstretched. If you want to have a visual of, of this love outstretched, it's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he had gone a stone's throw away from Peter, James, and John, he threw himself on the ground. He was outstretched before God as he prayed to God. Our love for one another, if it's to be agape love, has got to be outstretched love. It would be like if, 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 if I was... Uh, uh, who, who is that, uh, that superhero that's able... Is he stretch? No, that's stretch, you know, the, 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 the soldier. But who is that superhero? He, plastic man? Okay, but all right, who is he now? I mean, he's, he's able to, he's like rubber. He's able to just stretch his arms out and, and, and do things. In, in the, if I could stretch my arms out and, and wrap them around all of you, but yet everyone feel the same intensity and the same closeness to me that you would if you were right here receiving a hug from me just as an individual. That's what God's talking about. Now, you can't do that in the flesh. You can't do it in the flesh, but in the Spirit you can. God is saying that we should be able to show everyone within the body of Christ the same degree of love. He's not saying that you're not going to be closer to some people than others, but He's saying within the body of Christ, when you are born into this family relationship of God, and it is a relationship. In fact, all of the things that He tells us to get rid of are going to be relation killers. Relationship killers. And, and He tells us how important it is that we get rid of those. But here He's talking about our love for each other. We have been born through our obedience to God. God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, 
has purified our souls, has sanctified us so that we can be acceptable to God as individuals. Our sins are gone. They are no more. I mean, they are gone. You're not going to be able to... You might dig them back up in your mind, but God does not because our sins have been removed as far away as the east is from the west. Our sins have been taken and cast into the very depths of the sea. And we know more about the stars that we were talking about last week than we do about the depths of our own ocean. We don't know as much about what's going on down there. And that's okay. We may never know as much about it as we'd like to. But God is telling us in this new relationship, begun because of the action of God, God sending His love, for God so what? So loved the world. There is that, that fervent intensity. He loved the world. He loved the world more than He loved the painless relationship with His own Son. And He was willing, the Father was willing to suffer, the Son was willing to suffer in that love. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we, in our obedience to the truth of God, have experienced that love. Because when we yield ourselves to God, when we allow God to save us, even though God will say through the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, it, it takes some thinking about that, whenever he says, save yourself from this untoward generation. It's not that we are saving ourselves. It's that we are allowing God to save us. We yield to God's will. And through obedience to the truth, we have been saved. We've been purified. And, we, and that brings about a brotherly relationship with each other. And he said, so what you need to do, since you have been purified, since you have been purified through your obedience to the truth, you need to make a, a, very, a very positive, you need to make a very positive step here in loving your brothers. That's not always going to be easy. And if you read through the New Testament, you'll see, especially in, in the letters, you'll see problems that come up between brothers. If, you have, if, if you're not an only child, if you're an only child, you may not understand this family relationship of, of brothers and sisters. But brothers and sisters end up having problems. It's not always harmony. So God is saying, you're going to have to take a very positive step in your life to love one another as brothers. If you've been born of God into His family, then you should love those others who have been born of God into His family. And then he goes, comes back and he says, and it's not just a brotherly love. See that you love one another. That you love agape. Phileo and agape, both used in, in this verse. See that you love one another. See that you love one another from a pure heart Fervently, agape love. Not, not a love that has uh, uh, untoward uh, motivation. It, it's a love that, that is, is very wholesome and it's very fervent. And it's a love that will always stretch itself out. Listen to what God is saying here. If you have been born, you, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but of imperishable. He comes back to that being born again thought. Born again. And we see that earlier in, in chapter 1, in verse 3. Born again. How important that is. Our relationship with God depends upon that. It's the new birth. And you've been born again through imperishable seed. The Word of God. Luke chapter 8. The seed is the Word of God. And God sows that seed into our life. We have the completed copy. We have the complete Word of God. Everything that God intends for us to know, everything that God has said to man that He expects man to do, whatever time period that has been. But everybody did not enjoy that. The people of, of the first century did not enjoy that. They only had bits and pieces. Now those who, who were wealthy enough or those who had the right connections, might have a complete copy of the Old Testament of God's Word. 
And it's interesting, as we've been studying on Sunday morning about the Word of God itself and in our relationship to that and, and how it all fits together. It, it's very interesting at the end of, of the book of Acts, the, the Apostle Paul reasoning with uh, uh, Jewish people who were coming to him, Jewish leaders who were coming to him. And they were studying together, and they were studying about Jesus out of the Old Testament. And when the Apostle Paul was in prison, and he writes to Timothy, he said, Be sure that you bring to me my books and the parchment, the Word of God, the completed Old Testament. He said, Bring it to me. I need that. I need that. Early Christians were converted through their understanding of God's prophecy and His promises of the Old Testament. Don't, don't take that lightly. That's powerful. That's, that's so important. And here God is telling us that we've been born again of seed that is permanent. Not seed that will perish, but seed that is imperishable. He said, through the living and enduring Word of God. God is saying about His Word here, He said, it's, it's here, it will always be here. It's here. It will always be here. He's going to say that like three times in the next few verses. Through the enduring Word of God. Whatever men may go through, whatever men may try to do to God's Word, it's going to stay. It's here, and it will always be here. Very simply, that's what God is saying. My Word is here. My Word will always, always be here. And then he moves on and he talks, he actually quotes out of uh, Isaiah chapter 40. So if you want to go back with me to the book of Isaiah in chapter 40, let's, let's listen to what he is, is saying, what God is saying through Isaiah and what God is going to say through Peter as he quotes from Isaiah. Two completely different circumstances going on here. Whenever God first said this through Isaiah, he's saying it to a people that are, are living in the time of King Hezekiah. They have known prosperity in the past, but things are beginning to go south. Hezekiah has been a great king. He's been one of the best kings. Not the best, but one of the best kings. And he has always listened to God, and he has had great faith in God. But one of the problems that, that Hezekiah uh, has, has grown into, brought into his own life, is he's begun to trust more in his own judgment, in his own wisdom. And, and whenever other world leaders come, like, like from Babylon or from Egypt, uh, he doesn't have any problem showing them around the palace and showing them the wealth of Israel in the temple and in the palace, the different uh, pieces of furniture that were there in the temple and in the palace. The very walls themselves in some of the places uh, in the temple, covered with gold covered with gold. And, and maybe because he's wanting a, a good relationship with these other world leaders, and in doing that, to ensure more security for his own people. But he's not thinking about the one who gives all security. And that's God. And what it did is it put in the minds of the people, from the leaders from Egypt and the leaders from Babylon, to come back at some other time and take all that gold. And that's exactly what they end up doing. And, and, and so there, there is less of a secure feeling among the people of God during the latter days of Hezekiah than there was during the earlier days when Hezekiah would very quickly go into the temple of God and, and take the letter from, from the Assyrian uh, Shennacherib and, and he would take that letter that was saying to, to God uh, or to Hezekiah, uh, give up, surrender, and if you surrender, I'll let you live. I won't do with you what I've done to the other cities that I've conquered. Of course he's going to do what he did with those other countries. Because he, he's a ruthless leader. And, and Hezekiah is afraid. But he doesn't know how to answer him. And, and he goes in and he lays that. First thing he does, he goes in and he lays the letter on the floor of the temple. And then he lays himself out on top of it. And he prays to God. He says, God, what should I do? What should I say? And God said, don't say anything. Don't say anything. He said, I'll take care of it. And that night he did. He sent one angel that night. 
And that angel had the power of God probably a whole lot more, multiplied a lot more times than, than just to handle the, the army of Shennacherib. But that, that angel destroys 185,000. He kills 185,000 soldiers that night. And they woke up the next day, those that, that were still alive, and they're going, boy, this is not a good plan. And, and so the, the, the army ha has left, and, and God gave the deliverance. But now, but now the people are, are not trusting in, in, in uh, Hezekiah like they had. They're not trusting in God like they had. When you've got a leader that's not trusting God like he had done in his earlier life, then the people are going to feel the same thing. They're going to be a reflection uh, of of, uh, of, of what that leader is doing. And so the people are, 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 are disheartened. The people are afraid. And so God sends Isaiah. And this is what Isaiah says. Uh, beginning, uh, actually earlier, uh, he says, A voice calling, Clear the way of the Lord uh, in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert uh, highway for our God. Uh, let the valley be lifted. This is the, the prophecy of the coming of John the Baptist. And God is saying, I'm, I'm still in control. Don't, don't be afraid, people. And then in verse uh, 6, down through verse 8 of, of Isaiah chapter 40, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is, is grass, and, it is, and, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are as grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. That was the circumstance whenever God first said those words. They're still just as true whenever God has Peter repeat them in, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Because he's telling them the significance and the power. And there's been a whole lot that has happened to give the people evidence that God's word is still strong from the time of Hezekiah until the time of First Peter chapter 1. So listen to what he says to, to these early Christians as they're coming together, as they're learning more about relationship with each other in the name of God, as they're learning about their connection to God and their connection to each other, and that they'll never really have a connection with God without having a connection with each other. Do you remember what God said also in First John in chapter 4? He said, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? So stop and think about that. And so God is saying, again, for their sake, all flesh is as grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the Word of God endures forever. And this is the Word, this is the Word, which was preached to you. He says, listen to what God has said. Listen to what God has done. You know about God because God chose to reveal Himself. And He continues to reveal Himself through His Word. God chose to reveal Himself. And He wants you to know that. God's Word. God's, what, whatever, however you refer to it. Whether you're talking about the Word of the Lord whether you're talking about the seed, which is imperishable, or, or, or whether you're using some of those other phrases that you'll find in Psalm 119. Has anyone started on that assignment yet? Okay, y'all all did class like I did class. <laughs> you, you, got, you got real busy the last minute. And so there may be some of you that don't even think about it again. I'm going to remind you Wednesday night, if God allows Wednesday night to come, but next Sunday morning, whenever you see me, some of you may remember that and go, oh, boy, why do I... And, but what God is doing in, in 176 verses, Psalm 119, all but two, maybe three, depending on your translation, talk about the Word of God. They call it the way of God. They call it the will of God. They call it the precepts of God, the commandments of God, the statutes of God, the judgments of God, the law of God, however you refer to it. In, in what Peter is, what God is saying through Peter here, the very same thing. He says, however you refer to it, God has chosen to reveal Himself through His Word, through His commandments, through His testimonies, through His, His instructions, through His way, through... Uh, how, however you choose to look at it. The Word of God. And this is the Word which was preached to you. He said, don't, don't think there's, there's something else coming. 
This is it. This is it. You have everything that you need. You have everything that you need to believe in God. You have everything that you need to obey God. You have everything that you need to know in order to become a child of God, to be born into His family. And you need to know that God's Word is true. God's Word will endure forever. When everything else is gone, God's Word will still be here. Church, it's the one thing today. It's the one thing that we can hold in our hands, that we can read with our eyes, that we can hear with our ears, that we can take into it, we can speak it with our lips, we can take it into our heart, we can take it into our mind, we can think about it, we can talk about it, we can meditate upon it. It's the one thing that is going to be here when everything else is gone. Even this body that we have, when that body is gone, when this building is gone, when the whole world is, is turned into ash, when the whole world is dissolved, just like an Alka-Seltzer dropping it into the water, and it, and it becomes part of the water. When God returns everything back to just like it was before He had ever made anything, and then He presents us to a new heaven and a new earth. Whenever He welcomes us into His presence forever and ever. He said, you need to know that's true. You need to know that every word God spoke in the Old Testament was true. That God didn't make any of it up. And we're going to be talking more about that if God allows time to continue. God hasn't made up any of this. It all happened. Every Old Testament person was a real person. Every Old Testament city was a real city. Every Old Testament nation was a real nation. Every Old Testament king, even if you can't pronounce their name, it was, was a real person, a real king back then. Everything God has said is true. There, there's no reason for us to question it. But even if you question it, there is evidence to confirm it. And the greatest evidence that the Old Testament, every word of it is true, are the words of our Lord Jesus Himself. When He refers to it after His death, His burial and His resurrection, whenever He reminds His disciples that everything that was written about Him had to come true. It had to happen. All that was written in the law, all that was written in the Psalms, and all that was written in the prophecies. All of the categories of God's Old Testament. He said everything that was said about Him had to happen exactly the way God said that it would happen. And Jesus is, is the strongest, is the strongest testimony that everything we have in the Old Testament. It was completed 265 years before Jesus was born. Now, now we know it was written and completed a long time before that, but we have the evidence, we have the evidence that it was completed by 265, because that's when Alexander the Great gave the order. In fact, he gave it before then. It was, it was quite some time after that before it was accomplished because they had so much to do. But he gave the order for the Old Testament of God's Word because he had, he had met and conquered the, the Jewish people. And he wanted to know everything about them because he saw some very unique things there. And he wants to be able to read himself about their history. And so he gives instructions for the Old Testament of God's Word to be translated from Hebrew into Greek. And that was completed sometime between the year 265 when, when, when Alexander gave the, the decree until 165 when it was actually finished. We know it's true. And that's what God is saying through Peter tonight. He's saying, My Word will endure forever. He said, Don't miss that. Don't miss that. And then he goes on to say, because we have become what God wants us... That's not his word. That's my, this is my word. Because we have become what God wants us to become. Because we have become His children. Because we have been born into His family. Not of the will of man, or the will of flesh, or of blood, but of the will of God. Since that has happened... He says in chapter 2 and verse 1, Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit 
and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Why do we need to put those away first? Because those are relationship killers that will destroy the body of Jesus Christ. It is still happening today. Not only were they warned about it then, but you take malice, you take deceit, you take all the things that are connected with those, uh, you take slander, you take envy, you take hypocrisy, and you plant it in the middle of the body of Jesus Christ, and it will destroy the body of Jesus Christ. I guarantee it will destroy it. One of those things, if not all of those things, are the source of the divisions within the body of Christ. And so after He tells us that His Word will endure forever, after He tells us that we've been born again into this new family with God as our Father and Jesus as our older brother, after we have, have been obedient to the truth as obedient children that He talked about last week, when, or, or two weeks ago, when, when, we, when we come to this point, He is saying, because you have become what God wants you to become, then get rid of these things. Get rid of these things. He's not saying that you're actively involved in these things right now, but He's saying get rid of them. Don't let them stay around. Let me read it again. Therefore, why? What is therefore, therefore? It's therefore to say, because we become what God wants us to become. Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. said, get rid of those. They will kill relationships. And we have some of it creeping around here. And it does creep around because it's creepy. There's not anything wholesome or good about it. We need to hear that. We need to be able to identify it, and we've got to get rid of it. Because it will kill relationships. And then he says in verse 2, it comes back to where, where he's beginning. But he needed to say verse 1. He needed to say it, because what are we in Christ? When we saw Doretha's daughter baptized this morning, what did she become? She became one of God's children. She became a what? A baby in Christ. And that's exactly the way God uses the language here in verse 2. And the, the newborn babes, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the world. Newborn babes are the most susceptible to these things. To what things? To deceit, malice, hypocrisy, envy, slander. As newborn babes are beginning to learn about the family, just like you learned about your family as you grew up. You learned how your brother was. You learned how your sister was. You learned how your mom was, how your dad was. You're learning. But as you're growing up, you're learning. When you're born, you don't know any of that. And you learn it through what? Relationship. You learn it through relationship. You learn who's the strongest. You learn who's the most mischievous. You learn who's the weakest. I have a younger brother that he would tell on himself so many times. We tried to help him. Bless his heart. You can say anything about someone if you say bless their heart. We tried to help him. We're sitting at the dinner table. Mother was a master at it. She could get information. She, I'm going to tell you what. Washington, D.C., if they'd have just hired her, they wouldn't have to worry about all these conspiracy theories because she'd be able to tell them exactly what was happening. She was good. She would look at David. Maybe he's looking at me tonight. She would look at David and she would say, David, why did you do it? That's all she would say. And I'm trying to kick him under the table. My older brother's trying to elbow him. You let him know. My baby brother, he doesn't know any of this, what, what's going on. He's just learning all of it. But she'd say, David, why did you do it? And he would say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. And we're going, she doesn't know anything. She's fishing. See, we learn those things about each other. Or she would say, David, why'd you do it? Every time he would bite. I mean, he would say, I didn't really mean to, but, and we're going, oh man. And then we'd give him that look like, 
Don't you betray our, don't you bring us into this. Newborn babes, they grow up and they learn. They learn all about the other children. That's us. And it is either going to strengthen relationships or if we keep these things in our life, it will destroy them. Like newborn babes, this is God's desire for us. This is who He wants us to be. As newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word. The Word. Just the purity of God's Word. So that by it, you may grow in respect to salvation. Now salvation is sure. Salvation is real. Salvation uh, is, is something we can have confidence in. But you grow closer and you grow deeper and your roots are there. And, and, and your salvation... You see, that's beyond our, our ability to bring it all in. Our salvation is more sure? Well, it's sure to begin with. Because it's from God. And it's what, God, what we have allowed God to do to us. And, and so as a newborn babe, our salvation is, 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 is sure. It, it, there's not a question about it. Can it be more sure? Evidently. He said whenever you drink that pure milk of God's Word, your salvation is stronger. Your relationship with God becomes stronger. In verse 3, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Church, this is serious. This is serious. And with everything that has to do with God, our Father, that we know about, it's all based on relationship. It's all based on relationship. These are serious things that God says put away. Make sure they're not in your life. Why? Well, not, not only are they going to hinder you from being the person you need to be, but they're going to destroy others. They will destroy relationships. And sometimes those relationships never form again. That's sad. If you find yourself struggling with one of these, we're not saying that you have to come forward tonight and, and acknowledge that before everybody. It may be something that's going on just inside of you. But don't let tonight, don't let tonight close before you, don't, don't go to bed tonight before you have made things right. If it's with someone else, then make it right with that someone else. Leave your gift before the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother. That's so powerful, so important. Whatever you may need to do tonight though, do it quickly, do it right now while we stand and sing.